Uh, and it said that up until, well, part of the reason I guess they don't have the pub culture is because the beer was the end until 1984 or something. Oh, wow. And um, who's the other thing? Oh, part of the swimming culture now is because you know, all these people were in Iceland, they could be, they could see the shore and still drown because they didn't have swim. Oh. And now it's a big swimming pool. Mm. Can you hear me? I can hear somebody, but I don't see who it is. Is it me? Okay, it's okay. Oh, there. There's a bunch of them. Hey, Dave. Hey, Mary. Hey, all right. Hi there from Larry. Hey, Larry. Hello. Good morning. We'll give it a couple more minutes for others to hop on and then we'll get started. Sounds great. Okay. It's really strange. So for people who've never done this before, and this is my first time, um, I have the slides on a screen and that's all I see. I don't see anybody out there. I guess you can see me, but we can. it's really weird because I'm hearing all these sounds coming through <laughs> and I don't know who they're coming from or where they're coming from. Kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It took me a couple of times to get used to it because it is so weird. You're like, yeah. I'm looking at a screen. I can't see myself. I hear people, but I look, yeah. I'm looking at my slides. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of the yeah. virtual experience. I guess. Well, if you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, uh, you get a little uh, kind of a, a icon menu comes up. And if you click on the microphone, uh, little icon that will mute your microphone so that extraneous noise does not oh, yeah. come through to everybody else. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You, should, you should do that to avoid distraction. Definitely. But if you want to talk, don't forget to mute yourself or nobody will hear you. <laughs> everybody should have their microphone muted except the presenter. Yeah, really. Especially Jerry's. You never know what he's going to say in the background. <laughs> hey, Carl. Hello there. Okay. Good morning. We're eating our breakfast, so. Okay. 
Lynn, if you if you click on the little thumbnails that you can probably see in the upper right of your screen, just click anywhere in there. It brings up uh, pictures of everybody that's uh, online here. But then if you want to go back to the slide, you'll have to click on the, uh, the little Iceland swimming culture slide. Uh, and that will yeah. fill your whole screen with just the slides that. Uh, oh, are let's be on video. Oh, no. Okay, but I, I don't know how to get the video. See, Larry, I don't, I don't have. All I have is the, the slides themselves. I don't have any buttons or anything to, to select from. Do, do you see a picture of any of anybody <laughs> online? Uh, no. On your screen. <clears throat> no. Hmm, that's it's sharing. When you're sharing, you can't see anything but what you're sharing. Hey, Ma hey, Marty, Marty Graham's on. All right, all I think right. we have all the usuals that hop on. So um, if everybody could mute your microphone, except right. our presenter, just so we don't hear any background noise. And when if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and I will relay that to Lynn. Um, but today we do have Lynn Swisher presenting on um, the Cool culture of Iceland, if I'm correct. Um, I'm excited to see all your slides and hear about your journey there. Um, so welcome, Lynn, and I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn now, unless Roger, did you wanna say anything or? Your microphone's muted. <laughs> I think I'm ready to just go jump in. Oh, okay. I, just, I just wanted to thank our oh. romantic neighborhood couple we're taking this on. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, thank thanks, you. Roger. Thank you. Okay. Well, for those who don't know, I got to know a little bit about Iceland when I worked at the NATO base from 1990 to 2005. That's where I met my husband, Wilhelmer Gudmundsen, and where we return once or twice a year to see Billy's family and our friends. Billy learned to swim in grade school as a result of a 1940 law requiring all children to learn to swim. With fishing being the country's primary industry at that time, too many seamen were losing their lives because they didn't know how to swim. After this law passed, swimming became an integral part of Icelanders' lives. After we married in 1996 and lived for a bit in Reykjavik, we visited this pool after work before heading for home. As Billy liked to say, it's good to wash off the day while soaking in the hot tubs and getting some exercise in the lap pool. Later, after moving to Keflavik, Billy joined the prim Premier League at the Keflavik pool. This group included a local shoemaker and his wife, a local ship captain, an OBGYN doctor, an electrician, a car repair owner, a garage owner, and an accountant from the NATO base comptroller's office all working people who showed up at 6.30 to swim and then meet in the hot tub for lively discussion and debate about issues of the day and the weather. One of the rules for hot tub debates is that all sides of an issue must be presented, even if you personally disagree with the position you are taking. The Premier League even celebrated the winter season called Thore by sharing the old traditional foods together in the hot tub. These foods included things like sheephead, fermented shark, dried fish, and ram's testicles, along with plenty of brenovin, a potent schnapps made from fermented potatoes to wash it all down. But to understand just how important swimming is to the country of Iceland, you need to know a little bit about the population, geography, geology, and history of the country. About 365 people live on a volcanic island with an area somewhat smaller than the state of Colorado, surrounded by the Atl North Atlantic Ocean and bordering the Arctic Circle to the north. This island's winters are long and dark with just four hours of dusky daylight in December. In June, daylight can be up to 21 hours with the sun barely dipping along the horizon. Of, the, of those 365,000 people, about two thirds of them live in the capital metro area of Reykjavik. That leaves about 120,000 people spread out along the 3,000 mile coastline in mostly remote agricultural and fishing communities. The interior of Iceland is uninhabitable 
and represents about 80% of the total area of the country. In Reykjavik Metro, the population of 240,000 people have 17 swimming pools, public swimming pools. The remaining 180 or so pools are in, nearby, in nearly every town around the country and in areas so remote, the pools draw people from farms miles away from each other. You're literally, you literally find swimming pools in the middle of nowhere. Geothermal heat in the form of steam was seen by the first settler to Iceland, Ingolver Arneson, in the year 875. As his sailing boat came ashore at what is now called Reykjavik, translated as Smoky Bay, a writer of an 11th century Icelandic saga referred to using hot water for bathing and to heat his home. But it wasn't until the early 1900s that geothermal heating was used on a grand scale to heat homes, businesses, and public swimming pools. Iceland was called the land of fire and ice long before George Martin wrote the second book of Game of Thrones. Fire represents the volcanic activity above ground and sustainable steam heat and hot water under the Earth's crust. Ice represents the 269 named glaciers, representing about 11% of the land area of Iceland. So we have the then, the Middle Ages, when Iceland was settled by farmers who captured the hot water and used it for bathing and laundry, and the now, with the 200 or so swimming pools across the country, and geothermal heating in 99% of buildings and businesses. On the left is quite possibly the oldest natural pool in Iceland dating to the 12th century, when its namesake, Snorri Sturluson, poet and politician, wrote in the Edda saga about the tunnel acro um, across from his farmhouse to his pool. Today, this pool is part of a museum complex and is not open to the public for bathing. On the right, one of the 17 Reykjavik pool complexes located in the neighborhood called Kopavogur with a population of about 40,000 people. Some swimming pools have lifeguards, others don't. Some are centers for large sport complexes, others are small individual pools. Some are indoor pools, others are outdoor pools. Nearly all are open 363 days a year all serve nearby communities, but some might be municipal pools and others can be rural community pools. Some pools also cater to the large number of tourists that visit Iceland every year. But one key point about public swimming pools in Iceland is the emphasis on maintaining a high quality of water, using as little chlorine as is needed. This is accomplished through a partnership with the people using the pool and the people running the pools. The water in the swimming pools is treated and tested according to law, but the personal actions of bathers is a critical piece of maintaining clean water for everyone. So any public swimming pool will have these signs posted, letting all visitors know what is expected when they shower. Soap is provided and in many places also swim, swimsuit spinners and hair dryers. Towels and even swimsuits can be rented often. Iceland enforces strict rules about showering naked before putting on a swimsuit and entering a pool. All visitors are expected to do this. And while there aren't really any shower police, both staff and other Icelanders will certainly let visitors know these rules if they don't comply. While showering in front of others while naked is not something Americans are used to, it really doesn't take long to feel okay about showering naked in front of other people. After all, you're in the same boat. You won't see people staring and gawking at you. In fact, no one pays attention to anyone's body. And by enforcing this shower naked policy, water is cleaner and as a result, less chlorine is needed in the pools. It's quite, quite nice coming out of a pool and not smelling like chlorine. <clears throat> This is the pool where Billy learned how to swim. It was the first pool built in, ice in Reykjavik in 1937. I mentioned earlier that all elementary school children were required by law to take swimming lessons. Today, students attend lessons about twice each week as part of their learning curriculum 
during regular hours. A few years ago, this addition was constructed outside by the old pool, so visitors now have both indoor and outdoor swimming pools and hot tubs and a children's pool. When Billy and I visited Iceland in December 2019, we shared this lap pool with school kids who were for their lessons. That is their swimming instructor wearing the snowsuit. And by the way, the water temperature in the pool is a comfortable 82 degrees for lap swimming. The rule is if you share a lane with someone, you always keep to the right-hand side of the lane to allow for passing. The three hot tubs had different temperatures. The coldest pool is about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The middle pool is 104, and the hottest pool is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And by the way, the addition of cold pools is a, is a relatively new trend. I read that Icelanders believe cold dips are good for your mind, body, and spirit. And that coincides with their belief that they are descendant strong people that survived the harsh winters of isolation and hardship for ages. The largest pool complex in Reykjavik is called Lögerdalsloig. Pools are open every day of the year except Christmas and New Year's Day. They're used open from 6.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. Several of the lap pool are used regularly by school children throughout the week. Cost is, the cost to use the pool in Reykjavik is free for seniors 70 and older and children up to six years of age. Adults pay about $7 for a single entry ticket or $243 for an annual pass. And the annual pass is good for any pool in the Reykjavik area. Here's another shot, an aerial shot of Lugedal's Lug. There's also an indoor Olympic sized pool and a gym facility. This is the second most visited pool in Iceland with more than 1 million visitors each year. The first being the Blue Lagoon that we'll see here later on. Lögedad's Lug has a large playground area in the pool for kids. The bleachers are used when swimming competitions are held here. And this is the pool where the national swimming team practices. Something more needs to be said about the hot tubs in Iceland. Here you form a sense of togetherness with people known or unknown that generally leads to debate and discussion. If you look like a foreigner, you'll soon be asked, where are you from? Which gets a conversation going. Hot tubs are meeting places where all cares can be washed away and the world's problems solved. This is another shot of our favorite pool that I showed you earlier where we used to swim after work. It's nice to transition between different areas of the pool through these water channels. Going from the lap pool, you can get into the slide area or further on into the indoor children's pool or up the steps into the large jacuzzi hot pool. This is the inside glassed in children's pool with water exit to the outside pools. I might just mention too, that babies and children that are not potty trained are required to wear a swim diaper. Here's another view of our, view of our favorite pool. Uh, the jacuzzi pool is just beyond uh, one of the hot tubs here in the foreground. This swimming complex supports a population of about 19,000 people in Akureyri, North Iceland. Entrance is about $2 for seniors and a punch card of 10 visits can be purchased or even an annual pass. This small indoor pool serves the town of Seyðisfjörður, East Iceland with a population of 700 people. It was built in 1948 and offers two hot tubs and a sauna as well. This pool it, called Hlader is in West Iceland. The pool is very remote and not associated with a particular mu municipality, but draws swimmers from farms on both sides of the fjord. A newer pool located in Hofsos, North Iceland has one of the most dramatic views that we've seen. The wife of one of Iceland's film directors wanted to do something for the 200 people in this community so built this pool complex a few years ago. 
There's a picture of it at sunset. It also has a hot tub and waiting pool area, as you can see here. And to the right is the underground locker room and shower area. That island out beyond there that you see is the island uh, that I'm going to mention in a slide coming up. So just keep that in mind. The beautiful Quergerdi Quer pool in South Iceland was built in 1938 by volunteers. For a time, it was the largest pool in Iceland and was where the Icelandic national swim team practiced uh, before the Lugadalslug pool in Reykjavik was built. If you didn't know what Sundlug meant, you wouldn't know that this is a swimming pool. Located in a sparsely populated area in southwest fjords in a small valley. The, the pool is clean and unmanned, so you're responsible for taking care of yourself and the pool while there. There was no fee to use this privately owned pool, but donations are usually accepted. This pool is located in the northernmost coast of the West Fjords, that five finger area. It's up here on this furthest north area. <clears throat> we visited in 2018 with our Kim's friends, Kim and Jerry, for the first time. This pool was originally built in 1954 in the smallest municipality of Iceland with 53 inhabitants. It draws people from an area about 300 miles, square miles, and of course, tourists that manage to visit this remote area. <coughs> Excuse me. The scenery was spectacular looking out at the North Atlantic Ocean. And there were some good discussions in the hot tub too. Many of you know Kim, and, Kim Allen and Jerry Kaiser. This photo was taken at the top of a crater we climbed in North Iceland in July, 2018. I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little about the natural hot pool, water pools of Iceland. They differ from swimming pools in that the water is untreated and the government does not require testing for bacteria. Most natural hot water pools have a cold and hot source of water flowing into the pool area where it mixes and flows out naturally, so circulation of water is generally very good. You must be careful in natural hot water pools because it's possible to move through hot spots that could be dangerous. In the natural hot water pools, where admission is charged, these hot, hot areas will be blocked off to protect bathers. Many, but not all, natural pools are very primitive with no bathroom or changing facilities and no lifeguard. Many of the natural hot water pools are in very remote areas where rough roads or tracks require four wheel drive vehicles to access. So let's take a look at some of the natural hot water pools in Iceland. And first I'm gonna just blow my nose, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> That's a terrible thing to do during a presentation. Okay, this one is called Gretislug. <clears throat> it's another natural pool that dates to medieval times. It's named after a famous outlaw named Gretter, who was banished to a nearby island, remember the island I, I pointed out, for 20 years for his crimes. One night, Gretter swam ashore to find fire to take back to his island and spent the night in the pool, this pool, to warm up after his ocean swim. Thus, it got its name, Gretis Loig. Sometimes you will come across streams around Iceland that are steaming like this. A lot of steamy water is an indication that hot water is flowing into the stream. Reykjadal Sau, translated steamy valley river, has a popular bathing spot where the cold water of the river meets a natural spring. You see that facilities are limited here. Boardwalks have been added to help preserve the landscape, but the potential for damage to the natural environment is real when overcrowded with people. <clears throat> we discovered the secret lagoon with Kim and Jerry in 2018. 
This is a natural hot spring with good facilities that has become very popular with the increasing number of tourists. The steam indicates hot water is near the surface of the ground here. And if you can just picture the, the first settler coming into Iceland, seeing steam coming out of the ground like this, that's why they named it Reykjavik or Smoky Bay. Another shot of the secret lagoon, which shows nearby greenhouses that also take advantage of the available geothermal heating. Greenhouses produce vegetables and flowers for the local market. These hot tubs are located <clears throat> along the coast of Drangsnes, West Iceland, and serve a community of about 100 people. There's a cool, medium, and hot pool here. This is a mouthful. Horgsleiderlug, a primitive hot pool in West Iceland, is owned by several farmers, but with permission, guests can use the pool at no cost. Hoffel hot tubs in southeast Iceland provide changing rooms and shower at no cost. Here are a few more of the five different tubs there at Hoffel. One of our favorite pools is at the end of a long fjord in the west fjords of Iceland. You drive for miles and miles on a dirt road and come across this isolated pool with a primitive changing room. The view is absolutely spectacular and nearly every time we've been here, we've been the only ones in the pool. Another of our favorite natural hot spring pools is this man-made three-sided pool at the end of a valley. It's about a half mile hike here. The hot water runs off the side of the mountain into the pool and mixes with cold water from the river. This, this pool was filled with ash and debris uh, during the 2010 Eyjafjallajökull erup eruption and was going to be left buried until a group of volunteers reclaimed the pool for use. Often you find nice camping grounds near swimming pools or natural hot springs. And there was one further back the valley that we often camped at each summer. Our 2018 road trip took us to Reykjanes in the West Fjords. Vili and I had often stayed here on our travels. In the old days, this was a boarding school for kids in this isolated location. But today offers rooms and meals. This pool always kind of freaked me out a little bit because it was unpainted concrete. And I often imagined creatures in the water that I couldn't see. What if someone put a moray eel or a shark into the pool as a joke? It's a lovely remote location, also with an on-site campground. So it's often used by families for reunions. This relatively new man-made heated beach is in Reykjavik. Hot water is pumped into the ocean here, but also ocean swimming has become quite popular. And we watched one day as two ladies entered the ocean over by the red roofed buildings and swam outside the breakers over to the beach on the far left of the photo. By the way, the ocean water temperature is about 46 degrees. Here's another view of the heated beach in winter with the long natural pool for soaking after swimming in the ocean. I read that the health benefits of ocean swimming are scientifically based as well. It said that by jumping from cold to hot extremes like this, your body reacts by strengthening your immune system and increasing the levels of white blood cells. Your blood circulation and lymphatic movement will improve and your metabolism will increase. This results in an overall improved person with increased levels of well being and energy. If true, this helps to explain the addition of recent years of cold dip pools in the swimming complexes. Askau is a hot lake <clears throat> in an old volcanic crater far inland from the north coast. Years ago, Vili and I drove the exhaustive road to Askau. We met two bicyclists, one of them pulling a small trailer and having a difficult time on the washboard road. We loaded their backpacks and other belongings into our Jeep and left their things for them at the camping spot several miles down the way 
and then we continue driving over lava to Askau. If you look closely, you can see some heads bobbing in the water below. We visited the Mivaten area in North Iceland for a few days in December 2019 and enjoyed the Mivaten nature baths open year round with very few tourists around at this time. We have a pretty cool story about this place. On our 28 visit, uh, visit here with Kim and Jerry, Billy lost his wedding ring in the water. The water is very slippery. <clears throat> due to all the minerals in it. Well, we tried very hard to find the ring, but had to give up eventually. Billy left word and his email address at the front desk that he lost his ring in the off chance that it was turned in. We knew the chances were very slim because this pool bottom is sandy with some rock outcroppings and the mineral water is cloudy, making visibility impossible. The pool isn't emptied but once a year, so we went away heartbroken at the loss of his wedding ring. As it turned out, we opened an email later that same day with a note saying that someone had turned in Billy's ring, identified by the engraving on the inside. When we met Kim and Jerry for dinner that evening, Billy laid his hand on the table and then waved it in front of his face like this as we chatted. And we finally enjoyed the shocked looks on their faces when Kim and Jerry learned that we had gotten the ring back. This is the lifeguard who was watching over the few bathers on that cold and windy day, December last year, 2019. This is the same place on a nicer day earlier in the year, maybe summertime. In 2015, my brother Mark took a road trip with Billy, which included a drive into the center of the island to this natural spring pool called Clara Velir. No facilities here, just peace and quiet. Grota Gyao is the location for filming the Game of Thrones scene when Jon Snow and Egret consummated their relationship. This is a volcanically formed cave but after some recent volcanic activity, the water became too hot to bathe. This pool has been closed now for public safety. Probably the most famous and most visited natural hot pool in Iceland is the Blue Lagoon. Formed from the runoff from the nearby geothermal distribution plant, the Blue Lagoon is known for its mineral rich water that is good for the skin. Over the years, it has been enlarged and expanded to meet the heavy tourist demands, and today has a hotel and restaurants on site. Reservations must be made well in advance of visiting, and the cost is about $75. Here's another view of the Blue Lagoon at sunrise in winter, which is probably around 11 a.m. in the morning. And another view of it's really wonderful experience to be outdoors in the winter, possibly with snow falling on your head and hair freezing stiff, that is if you have any hair. Just a dip under the water melts the cold away. The last few slides are some recent additions in Iceland with people visiting year round. These have a spa feel to them and attract mostly tourists. This one is called Kroima. It's located next to the main hot water source for two towns. The hot water comes out of the ground at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and is mixed with cold water flowing off one of the nearby glaciers. There are five pools of differing temperatures and one cold dip, two saunas, and a relaxation room. Advanced re uh, reservations are required here and cost about $30 each. Another recent addition is called GOC, that's G-E-O-S-E-A, in the North Iceland community of Husavik. Here pools are filled with hot seawater. Pre-booking is necessary here and the entrance fee for seniors is about $20. There's also an on-site restaurant. It's very popular to view the northern lights from the inside the heated pools, actually could be any of the heated pools in Iceland. And the northern lights are best seen usually in October through uh, maybe February or March, something like that. 
This was a surprise. <clears throat> it's a beer spa at Arskogs Fonder in North Iceland. They have several indoor two-person tubs filled with beer that you bathe in for 25 minutes and then move to a relaxation area. The beer is said to have a revitalizing effect on skin and hair, and it's recommended that you don't shower for three to five hours. The beer is not drinkable, but each indoor tub has a tap, have, has its own tap with beer for drinking. The cost here is about $140 for two people. Another relatively new tourist attraction is diving or snorkeling in a fissure between the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates in the Thingvellir National Park. This fissure is pulling apart about two centimeters each year and the water here has been filtered through the lava for about 300 years. This water doesn't freeze, but stays a constant 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Cost varies depending on the package you select, but is around $100. Here's a picture taken by Jerry with an above view of the fissure and where they dive and snorkel. Uh, that's an entry and exit platform there that you see them on. And finally, I threw these photos in because kids in Iceland don't necessarily need natural hot springs or swimming pools to enjoy the water. This salmon river that runs through Reykjavik was in use one summer day when Vili and I were walking in the area. And that's it. So do you have any questions? <laughs> Those pictures? are to die for. I've never had a desire to go to Iceland, but I do now. <laughs> Good. Very nice. Very nicely done, Lynn. And uh and your last picture is certainly appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it was so nice. You know, we were just this was in the summer. I don't know, it must have been uh maybe maybe two thousand or so. And we came across these kids, and it was so cool just see them, seeing them play out there like that. Anyway. Todd, uh, yeah, can you hear me, Lynn? Yeah, Todd. Yeah, uh, so um, when is, you said there's visitors in winter and in summertime. When, are, when, is, the, when is the best time to go? Um, is it like... Uh, early summer or the latter part of summer? Usually July and August are the best times for the weather, mm -hmm. the best opportunity for weather. Um, but of course, you're going to end up with more tourists at that time too. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to want to have the best experience for fewer tourists, that would be in the winter time probably. But then you have mm -hmm. the, the winter weather as well. In um are there a lot of uh, tourists from Japan, the Japanese tourist uh, companies come there and to, to view the Northern Lights like they do in Alaska? They do, and the Chinese more and more are coming as well. Um, Billy, do you have anything to add to that? Billy says it's mostly Americans that go for the Northern Lights. But I can remember being, this is when I was working there and we were, we were going out um, one holiday season. They have, they have bonfires. We were going to one of the bonfires and <clears throat> there was a whole bus full of Oriental people. They came and, you know, invaded that particular bonfire that night. So they're, they're there. You have to, if you're there over the holidays in December, you have to get reservations very early, you know, a year in advance or more uh, for that. Good. Thanks, Did that Lynn. answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of curious. I know that in Alaska, okay. there's a lot of the Japanese and some Chinese go to Alaska during the winter months to view the Northern Lights. They especially go to Fairbanks and up north of Fairbanks, which is above the Arctic Circle. And they look at the, they do the ordinary lights. It's a, um, 
ritual. It's a ritual. It's a fertility thing. Yeah. So. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's a big deal, and to go see the Northern Lights and spend time up there. So I was wondering if it was similar. It's about the same latitudes. Yeah. Um, just for your information right now, <clears throat> travelers to Iceland are quarantined for up to 14 days. <laughs> so that, that is like some other countries that, you know, that are going through the COVID right now. Um, yeah. I read recently that, that the, for the tourist season, I think that they're going to be opening in June sometime, but they're going to require proof that you're you're not ill, and that can include an on-site uh, test. They're going to test everybody coming in if they don't have like a doctor's verification kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Lynn, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Renee Larry. just handed me an article um, on his iPhone that Iceland is reopening no later than June 15th. Um, I don't know what restrictions might still be in place for testing, but um, anyway, that's a recent announcement, no later than June 15th. So they're letting okay. the visitors come in. Also, I noticed that out in the countryside, um, apparently the young people, for the most part, uh, you know, don't use those pools. Is it just the tourists that we see? uh the younger people uh maybe in the cities that use those pools or is the uh is the culture kind of going by the wayside what do you think the the remote pools i would say are are probably mostly used by tourists because there there are many public pools around iceland you know in all of the small towns uh that the locals use um I mean, of course, you know, locals are maybe going to go to some of the hot pools too, but I think it's mostly a tourist thing. So I don't know if you read the uh, the articles that Roger sent out. There were two links. One was a 2016 New York Times article about pool cu pool culture in Iceland, and it's very well written and and really worth reading the other one is um a recent short article uh talking about opening up the pools after covid that has been recently and it was like it was almost like <laughs> they didn't say this in the article but it was almost like drug addicts needing their drugs icelanders needing their swimming pools and so they were they were really you know, it was it was a really big deal for them to be able to get back into the swimming pools. And of course, they were limiting numbers and that kind of thing, too. All but right. they're open now. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sure. Appreciate it. Thanks. Give okay. us a lot of insight. What's up there? Any other questions? Very good. Very okay. good. Okay. Well, go ahead. Hard. We're going to hop off and we're going to join Todd's Tabata Thursday. So we'll see you guys later then. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great okay. day and enjoy the Thank sunshine you. outside. Bye bye. Okay. See bye. you next week. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.